and uh, Kyoko, it's Yugen, right? Yugen. Oh, thank you. Yugen. Yugen. <laughs> I have the pronunciation checking too. May I? Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. The, um, um, is it Ramitush? Ramitush is correct. Ramitush Oroni peoples is, is the um, unceded ancest- ancestral homeland of the Ramitush. Ramitush Oroni people is how I gathered from Google. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's that one's. Yeah. I, I, I have it. Ohoni. Yeah. The Ohoni. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's um I know it's Ohoni. Um, yeah. I wasn't sure about the other tribe you mentioned, but um, I don't know either. The Timian and Ohoni and Timian peoples, I want to say where you are. Um, yeah, this this we did did check. It's it's Ramitush, but but the pronunciation varied from from like um, site to site. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Ramitush. I have because I'm in Oakland. I have the Ohoni, mm-hmm. um, but the the Chilkenyo, which I, I think is also part of the like affiliated with Ohoni, mm-hmm. and then um, like you would you would say on the unceded land of the Pueblo people. It's interesting. How would you phrase it? Yeah, I would say something of the um, the traditional lands of um, uh, twenty six uh, Pueblo uh, tribal. Mm. That would work. Cool. It's, it's one of the um, few places where um, uh, it's it's funny. It's like I, could, I feel like I, I either have to answer it with that or the twenty minute long explanation. So I'll gotcha. I actually researched and I got like a three page thing, and I'm like, mm-hmm. how do I <laughs> condense all of that to my life? <laughs> Oh, I so appreciate it. So that's so exciting that you're there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so from the traditional land of the 26 tribes of the Pueblo people? Yes, that works great. Sweet. Thank you very much. So.
Good evening and welcome to the opening event of the Ringlings Eco Performance Week and tonight's performance and environmental justice panel discussion. I'm Elizabeth Dowd, the Curry Coleman Curator of Performance at the Ringlings Good Sarasota. Good evening and welcome. Oops, double streaming there. Before I introduce the moderator of tonight's panel, I and the Ringling would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of Florida's indigenous populations, including the Calusa, the Seminole, the Miccosukee, the Tocobaga, and the Uzita peoples. We would also like to acknowledge the Angola community, known as the Black Seminoles. We recognize the privilege we have as a cultural institution occupying unceded territory which came at the expense of peoples that experienced imposed occupation and forced removal. We pay our respects to elders, both past and present who have, and continue to experience the ongoing repercussions of colonialism. We honor the earth for the resources it provides and those who came before, who valued and protected those resources. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across heritage and culture. We begin this effort with the recognition of what has been suppressed. Our week's programming includes several activities focused on arts practice at the intersection of theater, performance, environmental and climate justice. And we invite you to check out more at the link we've put up in the chat. As our conversation advances, you're also welcome to post questions and comments in the chat and we'll have time for um, discussion at the end with our panelists. It's my pleasure to introduce the panel moderator, Dr. Jessica Young, a Sarasota colleague. And I'd like to thank her and all of the panelists for giving their expertise and time tonight. Jessica K. Young is an assistant professor of global English at New College of Florida. She holds a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a concentration in Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies. This foundation in memory and trauma studies deeply informs her interdisciplinary approach to research and teaching, world literature, film, and art, where she focuses on issues surrounding colonialism, migration, indigeneity, genocide, state violence, commemoration, and restorative justice, justice across multiple global contexts. Her research focuses on representations of trauma and memory transmission in contemporary South Asian literature, and she is currently at work on a research project that examines the memory dynamics of gentrification and urban landscapes of remembering in multiple global cities, including New York, London, Mumbai, and the San Francisco Bay Area, where she is from. She has been invited to present her work at Harvard University, the University of Chicago, McMaster University, and in 2020, emceed the Sarasota Native American Film Festival. She is a citizen of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma. Please welcome Dr. Jessica Young. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for that kind introduction. Um, thank you also to the panelists here today. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. And thank you to the audience for, for tuning in. Um, we are looking forward to hearing your questions and thoughts um, when we wrap up the, the conversation to, to talk more. Um, I also, uh, since I'm Skyping in or Zooming in, as it were, from Oakland, California, I wanted to uh, continue on the land acknowledgement to, to also acknowledge that I'm on the ancestral homeland of the Ohlone, uh, the Chokenyo and the Miwakwetma people, um, and as well as acknowledge the ongoing activism of urban indigenous people who have sought to brought uh, issues of sovereignty uh, and, and uh, land stewardship into the, the national consciousness over the course of the last 50 to 100 years um, in this area in particular. Um, without further ado, I do want to introduce our three amazing panelists. Um, they're all very accomplished and uh, have a lot of really amazing, uh, amazing resumes. Um, I'm just going to give an abbreviated bio here to let, give them a little bit more time to talk about their work and the specifics about their work. Suffice it to say, if you want more details, it's definitely on, on the website for, for this panel um, if you want to learn more about them. Um, first, we have Hector Flores Komatsu 
was born in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Um, Flores is his father's last name, where Komatsu comes from his mother's family, originally from Nagano, Japan. At a young age, Hector uh, immigrated to the United States. And in between worlds, he was naturally drawn to theater. At age 17, he directed his first production and he hasn't stopped since, uh, luckily for us. Currently, Hector serves as artistic director of the Makuyeka, um, Makuyeka, sorry, Coactivo uh, Teatro, uh, founded after a year-long exploration of Mexico supported by the Tamar World Theater Fellowship. I'm excited to hear more about that. Uh, next, we have Ronnie Pinoy, uh, who's Laguna Pueblo Cherokee. Uh, welcome. Uh, she's a producer, composer, facilitator, and activist. Uh, she recently joined Arts Emerson as the director of artistic programming. Previously, as producer uh, at uh, as a producer at Octopus Theatricals, uh, she advanced the work of many outstanding artists, um, from development to production to touring in the U.S. and internationally. Ronnie is a composer at uh, at work on two new musicals with collaborator and Lisa uh, Diaz, and she's on the advisory board of First Nations Performing Arts and as a co as a co-founding member of the Industry Standard Group among many other notable achievements and advisory positions, uh, looking to expand investment opportunities for BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and people of color commercial uh, producers. Her current anti-racism practice builds upon a decolonization framework and embraces systems change as a key component of that work. Finally, we have uh, Kyoko Yoshida, um, who is the executive director of the US-Japan Cultural Trade Network, or CTN and co-director of the Theater of Yugen. Um, she served the performing arts, uh, in the performing arts field for over 35 years as a presenter, producer, and consultant. Her primary focus is on art artistic and cultural exchanges between the United States and Japan. Kyoku is the founder and executive director of the US-Japan Cultural Trade Network, CTN, which designs and implements exemplary arts and cultural programs in both countries. During the past several years, CTN has been exploring the intersections of Japanese cultural traditions and environmental sustainability uh, with concepts such as 72 Seasons and uh, Motenai, which we'll hear more about shortly. Um, so thank you everybody again for coming. Um, without further ado, I just wanted to pose a couple questions, some follow-up questions, but the first one that sort of struck me when reading these bios is that you all seem to be working at different cultural intersections. And in, um, in addition to these short intersection, introductions that I just gave, I wanna invite each of you to tell us more about your work and your practice with these sort of cultural intersections in mind. Kyoku, you focus on cultural and artistic exchanges between the US and Japan. Rani, you seek to promote uh, BIPOC um, uh, and especially indigenous producers. Hector, uh, you also work with indigenous practitioners and audiences. I'm interested in learning more about how you see these uh, cultural intersections in your work and how they inform your practice. I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> Feel free to jump, jump on. Oh, oh, I'm happy to go. I'll, I'll, I'll do the honors. Um, hi everyone, uh, Ronnie Pinoy. Uh, she, hers, um, and um, uh, calling today from the um, ancestral lands of the Piscataway, Pamunkey, um, and um, Piscataway, Pamunkey, and, and, and Acostan peoples today. Um, and so, so excited to be here for this conversation. Um, yeah, so I'm really, um, thank you, um, Jessica, for that um, great question about cultural intersections. Um, it's interesting because I feel like a lot of my um, work um, while rooted in producing and um, composing and, and facilitation has always had this thread running through it of, you know, what are the um, the narratives that are getting left out? I mean, I think that in our, um, in our society, we often talk about like, yeah, we need more stories, we need more narratives. And I think that something that we don't talk enough about is that there is a dominant narrative that does need some, you know, some restoring. That's my um, my lens for it that I, I that I find useful. That it's not just about adding to the narrative, but really shifting what that narrative is. And I think that that's something that's important, um, especially for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in particular, um, to really um, be able to bring 
uh, the stories, information, and uh, wealth of knowledge to the conversation. And I, I think that um, uh, climate justice is one area in particular where um, you know indigenous knowledge is is so critical. So um, you know, there's. You know, I often find, and, and I'm so thrilled about this discussion because I, I often think that so much of the focus around um, work that is at the intersection of um, climate, climate crisis, climate justice, uh, eco performance can focus on um, the work on stage and not about all the universe of work happening around it and how we make work and um, who's, t who's sharing, um, uh, you know, who's telling those stories. And, you know, indigenous peoples, uh, you know, often have some of the um, longest running expertise over tens of thousands of years on land stewardship. You know, I, I think that, you know, Elizabeth made a beautiful um, land introduction at the beginning that mentioned the, the stewardship, um, you know, of elders past, present and future. And that that's always been such a key relationship between indigenous people and the land is that aspect of stewardship and you know sustainability is is key um in that way so you know there, there's a lot to say about um um the ways in which indigenous folks have not necessarily been at the table in those conversations but i think in whether it's an artistic practice whether it's in um you know, how we uh, as an arts industry are partnering with others. I think that there's so much opportunity to um, to bring the the wealth of expertise that indigenous artists have to the fore. Um, and I'll just close by saying, I think a great example of this is actually a work that's happening um, in um, the New Orleans area right now with um, Mondo Bizarro that is uh, a work that is um, taking the ancestral knowledge of uh, Monique Verdan and her tribal nation of what the waterways were like before the levee system. And so as they're making changes to, you know, to the design based on all of the hurricanes, you know, the, the indigenous knowledge is being pulled into that and the artistic piece is actually contributing to the, the climate conversation. So I think that's such a beautiful example of how um, all of these issues are really intertwined and, and you can't kind of pull out one thread from um, from the weave, so to speak. And I'll, I'll leave it there. So, so yes to all that. <laughs> How can I follow up to all of that? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yes to all of that. Um, in my particular case, you know, growing up as a kid in Mexico, I remember thinking, why are all the people on TV and in movies that are made here white when most of the people in Mexico do not present as white. Um, and it seemed like uh, that was fine for, for the majority of the, this is back in the, you know, the 90s. And I remember when I moved to the States, this is early 2000s. Um, this was like maybe at the height of like the sort of like anti-immigrant um, high peak of like Mexican immigrants coming that suddenly from like just being a person in my life, the moment I got to the States, I suddenly became uh, the Mexican. And um, I felt racialized, now I have a word for that, right? Um, whereas before I never had to think about that. And so after so many years in the States of trying to, you know, as a kid, trying to be in theater and, and whatever, and feel like my narrative or who I was, wasn't uh, even allowed to be able to share themselves on, on stage in our case. Um, when I graduated college, I started asking myself, because I had the privilege of having papers to go back to Mexico and, and seeing how society was changing and, and, and evolving and asking new questions. Um, who are the people in my country who are facing the things I'm facing here in this country? And to me, that was very clear that it would be the indigenous people of, of Mexico, of whom I knew nothing of, because I, we were only taught in school that the Spaniards come, they conquer and like now you're Mexico, right? And that's not how 500 years of history actually, you know, permeates throughout society and people's lives. Um, and so I spent a, a full year uh, traveling across the country and trying to have direct human contact with people whose experiences were so different than mine. From that experience, I, I, I mean, I saw really cool things, right? Like amazing uh, landscapes, a really old, intricate, powerful ritual as well, which is very rich still. In indigenous culture in Mexico. 
But I think the thing that struck me the most were the, the, the actual individual stories of people who were living their life nowadays as young indigenous people and who were asking themselves the questions that I was asking myself at like 24, you know, like, who am I? What's my path in life? Where should I go? Which I think is a universal question <laughs> probably most of us ask ourselves. And from that question, um, invite indigenous artists, actors, either very experienced or like total newcomers to join forces and say, hey, let's make a play that talks about all of this. And we'll, we'll discover it as we go, me as like having the theatrical expertise, but you actually giving all the pulse in life of what that means. Um, and the result was quite, if I may say so, extraordinary for ourselves, the points of connections that were formed between, you know, what does a, a Mayan actor have in common with a Mushe, a third gender Zapotec actor, to then a Wirarita, Wirarica, you know, Wichol person, to then a Jarocho who plays music. And all of these points of connection reveal something very strong that we have since then been able to share with people across Mexico and, and thankfully across the, the world as well. Um, although now I can say that we're starting to ask new questions since COVID because things have sort of turned upside down. And I think we're at a point where the, I think it's very interesting, the, the, the idea of, of eco-performance because even though we don't necessarily intentfully deliberately say we're gonna talk about this um, in the play and in the work that's present, and it's now time to sort of be um, more intentively saying, let's ask what's gonna happen to the entire Mayan peninsula if you know X number of meters will rise up within the next hundred years, right? Hundreds of people in history will be erased and who will not have to face the consequences of that. Funny, I don't know if it's funny, but you know, strongly enough, um, my creative partner in Macuyeca, Josue Maichi, who is a Mayan actor, dramaturg, um, uh, uh, sorry, playwright, um, director from Chenko, Hopechen Campeche, was just here with, in Albuquerque. Oh, I am calling in from Albuquerque, the ancestral lands of 26 tribes of the Pueblo people. Um, and we were talking about how striking it was um, to find, again, points of connection with Native people here in the United States. But then his, his father, um, because, you know, a lot of people have been forced to use um, glyphosate, it's the word in English, in order to keep up their production for themselves and to sell and become part of this globalized economic capitalistic system or whatnot, um, got sprayed all over his hand with this glyphosate and he had to fly back to his, to his family to see if, if, they're, if they're doing okay. Um, and of course, all of those activities are also impacting the aquifer of the Yucatan Peninsula in this case and, and a place where it's known for, you know, it's big water deposits from which people would drink water. And now because of what happened to his dad in this, in this product, um, people can't drink their water anymore. And then, you know, Coca-Cola comes and sell that water. Um, and so <laughs> this has been happening for so many years, but I think now we're starting to, to uh, not only deal with the personal, but how, like, how can we do our work also raises questions that uh, we can't simply keep moving that, that way. Um, so it's, I'm very excited to be here and listening uh, with you. Thanks for the, invitation. Okay, so um, now I'm unmuted, pardon me. <laughs> and it's hard to follow um, Ronnie and uh, uh, you, Hector. <laughs> but, um, it just reminds me that one of the reasons that I stay in this country um, for 30 years and counting, it's because of people like you and this conversation. So uh, thank you. Um, um, it's been a great um, uh, opportunity and privilege for me to work in nonprofit arts field. Um, and uh, uh, oh, my name is Kyoko Yoshida, and I use she/her pronouns. <laughs> um, tuning in from San Francisco, uh, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Oroni peoples. And um, I want to respond to Jessica's question about the um, how the cultural intersections how they inform our programs and practices. And uh, to do that, if I may share um, CTN's renewed, recent, very recently, recently renewed vision statement because this was a result of our uh, uh, long process of strategic planning, which took place during, during the uh, COVID shutdown. So pardon me, I'm gonna read this. Uh, we are saying we envision that people in diverse communities in both Japan and the United States will deepen their appreciation of 
and respect for all beings, discover their innate cre creativity and its transformative power, and increase their resilience and vitality through dialogues, collaborations, and engagement in creative activities. Um, so this, um, I wanted to highlight the concept of respecting and, and, and caring for all beings, because I think it is deeply embedded in Japanese cultural tradition, traditions. And I think I understand um, native culture too. Um, and um, um, it's also um, uh, philosophically and practically connects directly to um, the environmental sustainability. Um, and my personal theory about, about this is that, um, you know, um, it's rooted in the ancient Shinto belief that there are, we call it Yao Yorozu no Kami, which means 8 million spirits or gods. So 8 million pretty much means uh, uh, infinite. So uh, it means that in every, every uh, being, the sacred spirit uh, is, is residing. So naturally, we cannot waste them. Otherwise, we would be doomed. And, uh, and the word motainai, which uh, Jessica um, highlighted at the beginning, uh, in today's language, it literally means it's, it's a waste or don't waste it. But it also means it is too good for me. Um, and if it's so good, we are not going to waste it. And there's also an important kind of nuance of being humble uh, in this word. So uh, maybe I'll elaborate a little bit later um, on this uh, interesting deep uh, word, motainai. Um, and I've been based in the United States um, for 30 years and I realized that I've been carrying those uh, values, these values and traditional um, yeah, uh, uh, thinking. And uh, the more I'm away from Japan, uh, I'm finding myself working more and more with Japanese immigrant women. And uh, some of them are artists and some of them are like specialists who are making miso or koji fermented foods. And uh, um, they, as well as actually myself as organizer and my awesome colleague, Miwa Kaneko, uh, we work very closely for both City uh, and Yugen. Uh, we're, we're cultural bearers and uh, we, um, we, we collectively, collectively you know, integrate um, these different respective expertise and ecological practices and, uh, into arts programs. That's how, how we've been uh, uh, operating for the past more than a few years. And uh, I would like to give some examples like 72 seasons, but I do want to check back in with Jessica. Yeah, um, if you uh, if you want to, we can we can move on to the next question. Or we can talk a little bit about the seventy two seasons for for a minute or two if you want. Um, yeah. uh, sure. Okay. So can we look at the slide then? Mm -hmm. Yep. The PDF, if you can be screen shared. So um, I think many people know that. Uh, Japanese culture has um, a lot to do with seasonal changes, but maybe less people would know there are 72 <laughs> micro seasons in a year. And um, this um, originated from hybrid calendars, lunar, lunar calendar and solar calendars. Um, it was adopted in Japan from China, uh, used for 1000 years, and really represents a, a way of looking at the year uh, through gradual transitions in nature, subtle changes, and also cultural and ecological practices around them each season. So we are sitting in uh, 72 seasons as a, as a programmatic framework. We will be presenting performing arts showcases and, um, and uh, collaborations and uh, digital residencies and all these uh, activities. The, a uh, picture um, of the 72 seasons. It's already artists who are contributing. Uh, Ari Koko based in New York, 
um, for example, is the uh, uh, visual artist and she does performances too. And her work is on the right bottom side, uh, right middle, uh, bottom middle, uh, we, we have a picture of um, Japanese American uh, choreographer, dance artists, Megan and Shannon Prashia, who are going to interview senior citizens and other marginalized members of the community and listen to their stories. Um, and we'll talk about the season, we'll talk about the food. And then um, from there, we will create dance vignettes then that will eventually culminate into a full evening piece. Um, and then next to it is, is another uh, uh, community photographer, actually my friend from all days in Tokyo, uh, who's contributing beautiful seasonal photos. And Arikoko and her name is Sachiko Takeuchi, but Arikoko and Sachiko already started to find each other on our platform and started to work. That's why we use the cover of 70 Seasons at the top. So that's that's the that's 72 seasons project. Um, yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's that's really awesome. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing. Uh, this this sort of brings me to to the next question, um, which has a couple parts for for each of you. But generally, I'm I'm wondering. Um, how your placement within these cultural intersections that you just talked about, how does that inform how you view or define performance um, and specifically for, for the sake of the, the programming this week, eco-performance. Um, what does performance or eco-performance mean to you and how does it influence your practice? And specifically, given what you've all been saying, I'm, I'm sort of interested in following up. Kyoko, um, you know, you just talked briefly about the concept of Montanai, um, you know, which in addition from like uh, not to waste uh, you, the CTN website says it calls upon us to respect and express gratitude to our envir environment, both in its natural form and in its trans and as it's transformed by human creativity. I'm interested in learning more about that. But then also, the 72 Seasons project. It's multidisciplinary. I'm interested in like how different forms of practice also come about and uh, are part of what what you're doing as part of that project as well. So two different projects. I'm interested in hearing more about. And then also for for Ronnie and, and Hector, um, I'm interested in how your performance practice or how you see eco-performance might be influenced by, you know, indigenous epistemologies. Ronnie, you talked a lot about st the stewardship of land, ancestral practices. Um, I, Hector, it was really interesting to think about, uh, you know, the different, uh, you, you sort of remind us that indigeneity is not a monolithic concept. It is already sort of a transcultural, cultural intersections. There's, you know, 572 or 75, uh, you know, federally recognized indigenous tribes in, in the United States and what we now see as the United States. Um, in Mexico, these, a lot of different, there's a lot of different tribes that are all sovereign. They have different language groups. They have different cult cultural customs. What does it mean when these sort of all come together and how, how does that sort of affect the performance? I'm interested in, in hearing a little bit more about that. Um, and, uh, and just and how that all sort of goes into like helping you understand what you mean by eco performance and how you define it for yourself and how it influences your practice as as performers. Hopefully, that's open ended enough to everyone has a little piece to to talk about. I'll yeah, let you jump I, on. I, I can jump on on that last question. You know what happens when that encounter happens, and I'm just gonna like put it out there. Like our first encounter was telling everybody, okay. My grandfather has this, uh, I, was, I was 24, but okay. Uh, my grandfather has this abandoned house in my hometown. <laughs> He's gonna allow us to like go in there and live together and work together for a whole month. And of course, like everything happens and it's really powerful and strong, but not only the, the product, the artistic product becomes interesting, but also the process of not only how do you work together, but then how do you live together when you have such different cultures, for example, the Zapotec culture of the south of Oaxaca, of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and this is specifically Mushe, um, Alexis Orozco, who's a Mushe performer, which is a third gender. It's usually men who, well, people who are born as men, but live and love as women and dress as so. Uh, what happens when this very powerful, like usually in your face, matriarchal culture meets the very solemn, soft-spoken, um, 
Mexicali in the state of Jalisco. So we suddenly had these very different energies living together in the same space and also working together. And in, in the case of how do you turn it into performance or eco performance in this case, um, at least for me, it was, it was a matter of saying, just as we say now, like introverts and extroverts, extroverts both like deserve like equal respect of their <laughs> sensibilities. Um, as a director, how does this bombastic, strong, um, forward personality also can live harmoniously with a much more solemn and quiet and introspective way of looking at the world? Um, speaking of a monolith, nothing to do with the Urraritari people who are the ancestral guardians of the peyote or the jicuri, as you call it in Mexico, versus the Zapotec, Isthmus, Tehuana culture, right? Um, and so in a way for me of, of, of having people gather together is how can we try to live in the same world in spite of our huge differences? And I think that's a huge question around the world, regardless. In this case, it was sort of seen in the microcosm of, you know, Mexican society or, or indigenous society, you can even call it that, um, and in a theater community, right? And so we have a responsibility to make that happen for us if we want to actually share work that is talking of and, and asking for better harmony and better understanding of each other to, to happen. And eco-performance-wise, I think after uh, that year of traveling, just seeing how much you can do with quote unquote, so little, and it can go so far out, right? Like everything you need is already there. I, I think I connect with that um, a, a lot, Kyoko Yoshida, um, about, you know, the humbleness that is necessary to do things. So we began saying all of the resources we're putting in to make sure that we are okay and that we can gather, we're not gonna think of any kind of stagecraft, right? We're gonna use what we have available and also try to make it poetic and evocative because it's all the theater, right? And we like that. Um, but then how, how it, the power of seeing, for example, Josue Machi's father called for the wind in a completely non-romantic way, but simply a practical way of when I'm about to burn my fields, I call for the wind because I need the wind to help the flames spread apart so that we can now cultivate the new crops. Um, how can you use that, for example, moment of magic not again in the romanticized way, but of simply putting faith and humbleness of I am at the mercy of nature. I'm at the mercy of the wind coming and the rain coming. And I think as we're experiencing, you know, as with the, you know, ludic proxy, we're at the mercy of nature at the end of the day. As just yesterday, we had a huge earthquake. Thanks Kyoko Yoshida for reminding us in Mexico City of 7.1. Um, and I think we have to live with respect to that and what we can control and what we cannot control. When we first did Andares, uh, thanks Elizabeth for the shout out, we're so excited to be joining you. Um, we were supposed to perform in Tehuantepec in 2017, this was in September, in this beautiful cultural center. And a few days before with tickets already bought and in hand, the earthquake of 27, September 2017 in Mexico happened. The house of one of our actors collapsed. The cultural center we were supposed to perform in collapsed. And of course, in that moment is how do you go on in a moment of human crisis, right? Um, but I still believe that at the end of the day, the power of, of theater and storytelling is that not only out of you know um, bread do humans live and stay and stay well. We also need a chance to have, be able to have human connection from a place always of respect. Um, and so it was, it was, I think, a very huge defining moment of us going in spite of what had happened and just try to be there for the community and share the stories of indigeneity in this case that connected strongly with people and I think that for at least for me stripped away any kind of like huge artistic intent okay yes I need like you know 20 ETCs because I want the light to like work in this exact way forget about it you know like you don't need it you have the sun right there for you um and at the same time you know being uh also practical as to like when do you do need light and, and and whatnot so I think it's I think just it's, it's embedded in it in, in a very um, inherent way. And with new productions, we're making the commitment to have all of the material that we actually uh, create, like any physical material has to be biodegradable. And if it's gonna be dyed, it's gonna be with natural pigments, um, which some stage designers in Mexico were like, what you wanna do? <laughs> um, but uh, that's something that we can do that we have the privilege of doing based on, on the work that we do. Um, and maybe, I don't know, that could, that could help also some other people try other other things. And just to end that, the one thing that I can say 
we always feel a little guilty about is, um, of course, we want to travel with our work. Of course, we want to meet people from other parts of the world and share and exchange. Um, but that also means airfare most of the time, right? Um, and a lot of you know carbon emissions. And so it's also a matter of saying, well, when is it like more beneficial that it is harming? And why should I also, as a privileged person that's gotten to travel a lot in this life, tell you know young indigenous people, oh, you're, you shouldn't be traveling because like that's bad for the environment. When like my carbon footprint across my life has been like much worse than um, one single trip. Um, but we're still, you know, post COVID, we'll see how. Well, if there is like post COVID, I hope so. Um, how how we, we we think around around that. No, thank you, Hector. I'm I'm happy to jump in next. I, I think one of the things that really struck what struck me about what you said was this notion of um, uh, the calling on the wind, not as something that was, you know, woo woo or romanticized, but was. Um, it, it, it was real, it was very matter of fact. And I think that there's, a, and, and also to um, Kyoko, what, what you were, when you talk about your work as a culture bearer and um, the women that you've been um, working with and speaking to, who, um, I, I think what, what is really um, moving me about this conversation and the intersection points is really the way in which this work as we're talking about it is, um, so intersected with those that are on the front lines of nature and on the front lines of the effects of, you know, climate change and the climate crisis. It's so, um, for me, the 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 strongest work in this space is one that that doesn't um, over intellectualize and say I'm going to put an idea on the stage, but it's one that is okay. How can I come at this from a space of, um, uh, you know, cultural practice of history of holding, you know, who and what is marginalized. It's, there's such a, an aspect of respect, responsibility and accountability in it more than I have an idea about, you know, how we're going to save the planet and let me tell you all about it. It's like, it's a different kind of relationship and, um, uh, and it's a thread that I'm, you know, seeing through everything we're saying so far that um, I'm really excited by. Um, and, and going back to your, your question, Jessica, about, um, you know, uh, what, you know, we think of when we think of eco performance and also um, some of the other questions you posed. Um, I, I would love to give a shout out to um, uh, Groundwater Arts um, that I was one of the four founding members of and I'm now a, um, moving to be a core collaborator. One of the key documents that um, Groundwater worked on for the last, oh gosh, probably three years now was called the Green New Theater. Um, and I'm going to drop a link to it in the chat. And, and really the notion with the Green New Theater um, is that it's sharing that this, the work of bringing together climate justice and the arts is not something that um, should be seen as siloed or kind of like off on its own somewhere as kind of a, you know, oh, we, and, you know, we do our kind of regular work. And then sometimes we do work that talks about the climate crisis. It's, really, I get excited and I really have to give a lot of credit to my colleagues, Annalisa Diaz, Tara Moses and Anna Lathrop um, for in many ways um, helping me, you know, build my own sense of this. But climate justice for me, it's it's such an, um, an umbrella for understanding racial justice, economic justice, the work of decolonizing society. I'm really excited by that idea. And if I had an additional 20 minutes, I would go off and, and just keep talking about it because I think it's such critical work. Um, but for me, all of those things are kind of the same. You know, if you're addressing climate justice, you're addressing all of those things. You know, we, we know that marginalized communities are on the, um, are really on the front lines of receiving the bad effects of climate change, whether it's cancer from um, toxicity, whether it's um, the folks that were living um, right around the Fukushima nuclear power plant in, you know, in Japan. So it's, um, uh, I, I, I'm really interested in a frame of looking at climate justice in the arts that really thinks about it holistically. So um, with the, the Green New Theater thinking um, is that we wanted to really shift the conversation to be one where um, arts workers weren't, were thinking about 
um, okay, here are five ways that you can kind of shift the way you're thinking um, to bring climate justice forward. So you wouldn't necessarily think the publicly transparent budget budgeting might have much with climate justice, but when you actually think about what that does to be transparent about what you're spending as an organization, if you're an organization, or what you're spending as a small arts collective, if you are, it brings in conversations around um, fair wage and work equity and, you know, taking care of each other in such a way and, and really making sure that your values are aligned with your resources. So, I mean, when you start to look at it in, in that way and think about how is what I'm actually doing reflecting my values, then you can kind of see why, oh, okay, that has something to do with climate justice. So, and it's things like that, you know, we also talk about um, um, uh, breaking, um, oh, let's see, um, shifting forms of leadership to be less hierarchical and vertical and kind of extractive and thinking about other ways of making decisions. Um, that's another one. And, you know, there's, there's a lot more on the, um, um, on the Green New Theater website, but it, it really, um, it, it shifts the conversation from being one of what, of what can just I do, but what can we do? Like, what can we do as arts workers? Um, and, and I so appreciate your point, Hector, about, um, um, about travel and about the impact of the work that we do. And, and I think that's something that doesn't get enough of airtime is the way in which um, the arts really gives the oil and gas industry license to operate in a lot of ways, whether it's the you know BP sponsoring the New Orleans Jazz Festival every year, whether it's um, you know the money that's going into the museum sector, or, or who's on your board, right? And there, the the kind of low hanging fruit is oh well, um, not and not to say that it's not incredibly important, but there's a lot of things that feel like, oh, that's something I do, so I can maybe stop doing that, which will kind of be part of making a difference. But there's also a lot of um, levers and a lot of influence that the arts field can have if we come together and say, you know, no, we're gonna divest. You know, we're gonna not take money. Um, we're gonna not take sponsorships from oil and gas and related industries. And you know, if the performing arts starts and the wider arts field follows, that would have a huge impact. And um, I would I would really encourage folks to take a look at um, fossilfree.org. I mean, of all of the strategies they talk about of how we could really turn around the climate crisis, working with the arts sector to divest is one of their top three strategies, which just blows me away. Um, so, so I get really... Um, excited about that that aspect of eco performance and, and I guess for me eco performance is a really helpful language for work that for folks are doing right now in this moment to get us to a place where all of the work we're doing is really trying to move us forward to be in a future without you know climate crisis so hopefully we won't have a need for eco performance in the future because all work will be within that umbrella so you know just in the spirit of you know um, it, it's hard for me to think about this without thinking about um, uh, a holistic way in and about um, uh, responsibility and accountability. And I guess the, the last thing I'll just say is that, um, you know, it's, I, I have, um, I do wear a lot of hats in the different practices that I have, you know, with Groundwater, with my new role at Arts Emerson, and then also as a um, composer as well. And, you know, the values stay the same and then the way that it manifests is different. And I think too, you know, um, for instance, at, at Arts Emerson, um, my focus is really one of um, stewardship, you know, of who is receiving resources, whose stories are being heard in advance and who isn't, you know? And then in my composing practice, it's, um, you know, about uh, holding that kind of sense of responsibility and accountability in a different way. So it's, you know, I, I, I really, um, you know, want to encourage folks listening that, um, you know, of course, no one person can do everything. But if you take that kind of values lens into your work, there's a lot, there's a lot of doors that might open and a lot of ways in that you might not, um, that you might not think of. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, there's so many things that I wanted to respond <laughs> to both of you. <laughs> um, yes, regarding travel, you know, uh, CTN, um, myself, um, used to um, lead 
um, and I know Elizabeth was in this position doing uh, American delegation to um, Central and South America uh, performing arts uh, curators exchanges too. And I was doing that um, for Japan. Um, and, but then, you know, we are reflecting and, you know, we are so determined that if we're gonna really travel, it needs to be really meaningful we share what the resources that we collected. Um, and uh, once we make that connection, you know, um, utilize the digital um, communication, like how I think a lot of people, one of the things about COVID, of course, it's it's been devastating, but at the same time, you know, it made us realize so many things. Um, time to, you know, look back, slow down a little bit. You know, birds are flying lower now, <laughs> not all the way high up in the sky, you know. Oh, and then again, this whole, whole thing connects back to the appreciation and recognition and respect um, for the nature as well um, as, uh, um, you know, dif different culture, different, um, different, uh, um, yeah, different people, you know, because, because by really learning each other um, differences and similarities, that's, and then especially if that's put into or combined into the process of creation or making something together, that is a really strong uh, potential of, of bonding and uh, sharing and understanding each other. Um, and, uh, yeah, so um, going back um, a little bit to the motainai, um, you know, this, the humbleness, and you already uh, said about this too, but it's really um, used a lot by Japanese environmentalists. Also, uh, Kenyan environmentalist, Dr. Wangari Mathai, uh, who received Nobel Prize, she um, articulated the slogan at uh, United Nations, and uh, it's now in the uh, English Wikipedia. So I do want this uh, word of Mutainai to be, um, you know, shared more and, uh, you know, not just our, our um, industry, but, um, you know, larger community to embrace um, the bigger, that doesn't have to be better. You know, the, that's one of the things, um, although I, I do, the, the, the exchange that I've been doing has been reciprocal. We are not just bringing Japanese artists and their works here, but we do send American presenters and artists to Japan. And, you know, um, when we did that, we did engage in really deep, uh, you know, conversation about what is your burning issues from aging to self-censorship and of course, environment. And so, you know, I think, um, yes, we were, and more, even more now aware of the uh, carbon footprint, but sometimes, you know, um, visiting each other's uh, country uh, and meeting in person, especially for the first time has, has the value too, um, I, I think, and I believe. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. The, we're, you're, we're, we're, promoting the this notion of eco performance as well um i was it uh, our super colleague elizabeth who's who's created this word or, uh and uh, eco performance week um you know uh, i i think this is this is a is, is, is a great context that we push forward the notion yeah Great, thank, thank you. You have all made my my job as a moderator either very very easy or very difficult because you have all anticipated all the, the next few questions that I was going to ask, including, you know, how is envi what is environmental justice to you? How is it bring in uh, issues of other forms of injustice, racial injustice, colonization? How can it how can an environmental justice be linked to modes of decolonization, anti anti racism work and and things like that. So let me just put that out there that you can talk about how you define environmental justice. Ronnie, you has already really gone into that, which I appreciate. But you, you said you had another 20 minutes of material. 
you know, maybe not 20 minutes, but you know, you can you can tell us a little bit more about how you see environmental justice uh, uh, playing out, and maybe what what you hope. Since other people have talked about COVID, where where do you hope that 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 on stage, off stage, where where environmental justice uh, might go uh, in the future? Now that we're sort of re really fundamentally rethinking our forms of human attachment, rethinking performance, and how and the stages, both virtual and real, that that are possible at this moment. How does that also get us start? to start thinking about eco-performance environmental justice. So just to, just to recap, since we're putting a whole bunch of things together, slow down, back up a little bit. Tell me a little bit what environmental justice or climate justice means to you. Um, and how might, you, how might we envision a better future uh, along the lines of how you envision environmental justice through performance, both on stage and off, um, especially as we're sort of rethinking the world and the performative world uh, in this hopefully soon post-COVID world, or at least more normalized world. <laughs> yeah, I can, I'm happy to start us off since I got um, uh, so excited and, and went, already went on a justice kick. <laughs> but yeah, I, um, um, for me, uh, really unpacking and understanding um, decolonization uh, was so helpful to me in understanding how we might um, transform our society to um, be one that is um, regenerative instead of extractive. So, so I think we often talk about climate crisis, but we don't always have great language for what the the next thing is. You know, is it? Are we making an equitable, just society? But, you know, there's. Um, I find that folks. One of the biggest challenges that folks can have is often getting to the. So what is the thing? And to really dream and vision what the new thing could be beyond saying, okay, well, here is um, the risk and here is the step, the kind of minor steps you can take. You know, like, have you really kind of imagined what a, you know, um, that future world like smells like, what it feels like to leave your house in the morning, you know? And I mean, that's the kind of dreaming and imagining that arts workers are really primed to do. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think that's sometimes an opportunity. It's real. It's a really daunting one, but I'm I'm excited to see more of the, you know, kind of speculative visioning of a future that is a good one, rather than a um, cautionary tale about what could happen if we don't get it right. Because in a way, it's a lot harder to imagine getting it right than it is to, you know, imagine getting it wrong. Um, but to um, to talk just a hair more about decolonizing. Um, and yes, thank you, um, Elizabeth, for um, uh, giving a shout out that Groundwater will be leading a decolonizing theater basics workshop this Saturday. So, and, and this will, you know, be touched on in much greater depth um, there. But, um, you know, so much of um, American society is really, you know, an echo of the moments of our history. Um, everything from capitalism to the way that we think about labor, the, you know, so many cultural things about our society are rooted in the kind of history of extraction of folks coming from elsewhere, um, you know, taking resources from land, from the people that were here, from the indigenous people that were here, the um, long and, you know, violent history of slavery. And in and, and the way that we, we tend to treat each other now and the way that we, see it as so transactional often, the way that our economy is built, it can all, you can all draw lines back to the kind of extraction of settler colonialism. And, and it's something that is, um, you know, academics have spent um, a long time really drawing those lines. And in a way it's a, it's a whole body of work that hasn't, um, uh, hasn't really made it into the popular zeitgeist of it being connected to some of these bigger issues. So in a way, if we if we think about, okay, what would it look like to decolonize our society? Um, it, it really does kind of operate in tandem with, ooh, what would a climate just society, you know, what would a regenerative society look like, you know, that isn't extractive, but, you know, is moving into this other space. And there's a lot of really tangible um, tactics and strategies out there, you know, some of which I alluded to um, earlier. But, you know, if just as folks say that, you know, racism is structural, so anti-racism has to also be structural. 
um, we're in this settler colonized state, you know, and we're living the aftermath of, of this history. And so, you know, it's going to take a, a similar kind of structural change, um, you know, in order for us to, to see this just society. So, so in terms of bringing it into arts practice, I think, you know, both on and off stage, there's so much modeling that we can do and both with the kind of imagination and vision and also with leading and how we treat each other. And that, I think that brings you, brings me to the, Jessica, your great question about COVID that, um, you know, for some folks, some folks were furiously working um, just as hard as they would be normally in making virtual theater. Some folks were working uh, just as hard, if not harder, to put food on the table while, you know, their their live theater industry um, job. And I mean, everyone's story has been different. And the society we're coming back to, while it can feel like, oh, my, I'm the one who's out of shape and not ready and trying to meet it, everyone and every organization is in this moment and i think it's it's going to be a real risk to to want to fall back into something that we're familiar with but we've all gone through a collective trauma together you know and it's um if we don't hold that that's really what it was was a a collective national trauma um we're never you know it's um all the kind of hope of, well, it's post COVID, so it's gonna be different, isn't necessarily gonna be the case if we don't actually acknowledge the the real pain and like actually go through a grieving process, you know, of um, uh, of what was lost as well as what was learned, you know? So some, some big heavy <laughs> stuff that's kind of, you know, I guess that's kind of my brand, but um, uh, for me, all of this is like such an opportunity as an arts worker to kind of hold all of this and bring it into your practice wherever you are. Um, and, you know, I guess the last thing I'll just say is that I think artists in particular can kind of infantilize themselves sometimes that that this is just too big to take on. And it's that it's like that's exactly who we need, you know, who better than artists to kind of lead lead us into a kind of a new way of thinking a new way of of seeing because we all need such a new way of seeing um, it all in there. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I resonate a whole lot again, but um, just um, following up on what you just said, Ronnie, that um, if we can see, if we can uh, show this uh, slide again, I'm sorry, the PDF, um, the the other project that I wanted to, to, to just share with um, you all, um, was um, the, this was right well, I mean, 2019, May, so pre-COVID, but a uh, multidisciplinary composer, Tomoko Momiyama, um, weaved together, you know, different stories of um, Japanese immigrant. And just quickly from the top left, the first one was the uh, Sierra of Yugen's founder, Yuriko Do is also a sea adventurer. So she was, talking about her journal in Japanese. Tomoko is a professional translator too. So she was simultaneously re reading it in, in, in English. And we have, there were uh, five koto, the horizontal sitar, Japanese string, uh, traditional string instrument set up inside a little firehouse, but um, we carried one to each spot. Uh, for the journeys. And the second one to the right, that was um, Aisuke who, uh, who collected the stones from Japanese inter internment camp in Topaz, Utah, and brought back. And uh, he's, uh, he would put each and one stone for the years that his great grandfather um, spent in the United States, but then, and asked the audience to count together the years, but then for the internment camp years, 1941 to 45, we just put the stones in silence. Um, and then below that is a Kanakoa weaver. She's a seed specialist. She was explaining about the rock behind her that has millions of years and the, uh, you know, asking um, uh, participants to think about the microbe beneath the land she's standing. 
And then the final scene was to, to the left bottom where Tomoko is now talking about the uh, mi migrating birds, how they changed because of global warming and how they, some of them are lonely, but trying to mate and uh, crying. And up until this moment, she was asking participants to make noises inspired by the stories told, be it the sea turtle approaching the boat or the microbes underneath the, the big rock. But here she says that um, now please think about one sound that you, it's so precious to you that it can, you want this sound to be passed down to generations but don't have to vocalize now. Don't have to make noise yourself. Just think about it and hold it. And then we all went back into the fire firehouse to for the final koto um, uh, piece with uh, with with uh, Shoko, um, the koto ex, uh, expert. But uh, I, I just uh, I think that there's a you know there there is there's, there's a space and opportunity power. Arts can be a powerful tool because it can really move people's emotion. It, it's, you know, the, the, uh, the, the vicarious experience, if you can engage, so be it, uh, you know, lecture performance like this, or, um, you know, Aya's uh, uh, Ludic Proxy, you know, um, the ways to think about the ways to engage them, um, it's important for the art piece to to be powerful so that more people can really you know get it and act on it as opposed to just reading about it or the looking at the scientific data or the number um it, it's supposed to be you know telling stories but when artists or or the rocks or the even the little stones from from topa's internment camp they can tell stories too when artists are involved and the uh, audience are are, are, are engaged. So uh, just wanted to share this this piece, uh, which I it was difficult to do because of the visa problem, you know, the borders. But uh, but 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 uh, that that piece too. That you know, instead of uh, uh, bringing a finished piece and performing there, this was uh, just Tomoko coming here by herself in residence for a month, and then creating our um, artwork with. Uh, local artists and community members. So that's from from the carbon footprint point of view. That was a, a better. That that's that's a, a, a good way to do do this uh, art, arts program as well. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Well, um, you know, Ronnie and Yoshida-san, it's just <laughs> so inspiring to hear uh, both of you. I am leaving this. Zoom meeting feeling much more inspired than most of the Zoom meetings I have been in the past two years, uh, truly. Um, I keep going back to the, it's kind of as a theater maker, you know, jarring to think that the discipline that you chose perhaps is the most inefficient one of the narrative arts, uh, just based on the amount of people you can reach, the amount of time you have to put in. At the same time, I do believe that it's one of the most profoundly impacting forms that it can be for those that get to experience it. Uh, so Ronnie e echoing on that idea that yes, we can't, we're not, we shouldn't infantilize our work. We should believe it has the power to do stuff. As we've seen how so many things have changed from you know, a grassroots movements from the ground up, we can do so as well for the theater arts. And if maybe we start doing it, then maybe um, you know, the regional theaters will start doing it, and then maybe Broadway will start doing it, and maybe like society, there you go, I got what you meant. Um, and I think even, even if it, it's slow, and it's maybe not as clearly effective, uh, or immediately so, I, at least it has also the power to change those, so those of us who engage with it. Um, and tying it back together to eco-performance and the idea of indigeneity and how we can learn from each other, um, you know, Yoshida-san, the first time uh, Makuyeka, we as a company, we traveled to Asia. We had the privilege of, of being to Wuchan, China and uh, seeing the situation there and uh, you know the effects of a rapidly developing um, push economically and, and the effects it has on its different native peoples as well. And then being able also to spend some time in Japan and for some of our company members to see, for example, um, you were talking about Kami and about Shinto and seeing 
how their own perhaps uh, spiritual relation to nature uh, would, would they were able to see it in a place where it wasn't colonized, right? And giving them also a possibility of imagining a different way of continuing their practice in their own context. Um, and it's interesting because we remember getting on the, maybe this is too specific, but we remember getting on the bullet train, which I believe was actually modeled after the beaks of birds as to how to like make it best to travel in, in the most efficient way possible, both energy-wise and time-wise and whatnot. And one of the, you know, uh, Jose Maichi, who's from the Yucatan Peninsula, and right now the government is planning on investing this huge amount of money to building a train that runs on diesel <laughs> in the middle of a very um, environmentally precarious uh, space and just making the connection of, of you know, how could it be possible for us to, to create something that is in harmony with nature, but at the same time allows us to also interconnect with each other in a much easier way, in this case, transportation. Um, and I think, at least I can say for us, who have been able to benefit from not only sharing our work, but to also enrich ourselves by that shame sharing. It's something that gives us a lot of um, hope that it's, it's still worth it to be doing this crazy theater thing that we keep wanting to do. Um, so thank you both for, for the for the inspiration and, and Jessica for the facilitation and Elizabeth for the invitation and everybody else for um, listening and I'm sure sharing some questions or thoughts soon, right? Jessica, or am I just jumping? Yeah. Oh no, <laughs> to yeah, the next just soon. We have about maybe five minutes before I do want to leave some time for for uh, quick questions. Uh, and uh, from from the audience, but I do like want to follow up on something that you were just saying, Hector. Um, so very, very briefly, um, and, and uh, Kiyoko, you were also talking about storytelling. Uh, many of you mentioned um, Ludic Proxy Fukushima, um, which is a, a performance, a virtual performance that people can see um, uh, through, through the Ringling. Uh, hopefully we'll post a, a, a link in the, in the chat. Uh, but in it, it uh, uses sort of a, a video game dramaturgy uh, where your avatar, Ma Maho, visits her sister in Fukushima four years after the reactor meltdown and we experienced the struggle to understand the difficult life choices one makes when living just outside a nuclear evacuation zone. It's incredibly compelling um, and it has this really interesting storytelling structure where you have this avatar, you get to make decisions and that affects the performance as an audience. And one of the things that made me think about this as you know, storytelling, but then also like you, Hector, you said this was a you know, performance can be a very labor intensive and maybe not efficient way of, of communication, arts communication. But at the same time, I think it's the, the, prox the proximate interaction, the, the, the relationship that you build with an audience makes it uniquely powerful. And I'm wondering just a minute or two each, if you can say just a little bit more about how you sort of see maybe the possibility of, of change based on that very, very important interaction between the performer and the audience broadly conceived and what, how that might actually work as a way through to envision the speculative future that Ronnie was talking about. So I was just talking to a couple of friends from around the world who are also theater practitioners. And we were saying that we wanna create a space where maybe not everybody will get or even like if you can use that word what you're sharing with them but that at least you know people from any kind of background get to see into the work from their own space not level but space of understanding right um and i think one of the most powerful theater experiences that at least i've had is when i leave the theater with a question is not immediately solved and that question sits with me for a while right um, and sometimes I'm even now trying to figure out a question from that one play I saw five years ago. Um, I still believe personally that theater is also entertainment. And so how do we get what we want to say to people from all kinds of life? And I say this from maybe a very pragmatic like way of thinking about it, which is if I go to a small, let's say, Zapotec um, or um, Mayan community in Mexico, and I start trying to talk about all of these ideas about, you know, um, whatever, e eco uh, performance and like climate restorative. And they'd be like, um, I just came back from like spending six hours on the field. Can you just like chill? <laughs> and so um, it's a real thing too, you know? Um, so how can we be able to, to reach all kinds of audiences in a way that 
allows them to sit through the question in, in the moment that they're going to be uh, wrestling with it and from their own space. Um, and I think that that's, that's also done through, you know, work that is accessible both at a thematic and rhythmic and aesthetic and musical even uh, level, right? Um, and so that's what, what I, I think it's important that we also acknowledge that, that those questions we should be able to speak, for, say, uh, pose them from a place of, um, you know, not a hierarchy if I have this solution or this question. Um, but I agree with you absolutely, the, the, the relationship you build with an audience. I mean, one of my favorite experiences ever, this is maybe like true democracy, I don't know. We were in um, Tinun Campeche, which is a Mayan town. And we started performing the play in, uh, at the evening and people would, would trickle in and set up chairs instinctively in a semicircle around the performance space. Um, and one of the performers who is Musha, which is their gender. Um, so he or she or they were wearing a dress, although they presented as male. And suddenly two men um, who are a little bit drunk, I gotta say, it's okay. It's like the end of the day, why not have a couple of beers? That's fine. <laughs> Just sort of join in. And one of them looks at her and says, that is not a man. That's, that's not a woman. That's not right. And then the other guy, slightly less drunk next to him, says, oh, but isn't that theater, I mean, um, uh, freedom of expression? And the first guy goes like, oh, yeah, I guess I hadn't thought of it that way. <laughs> you know, like just in the middle of the performance, right? And, and I think that the beautiful lesson for us was not that. We didn't have to come and like sort of like push the idea onto them but also allow people to wrestle with those questions as they come up in a commun communal way and, and from their own uh, you know, understanding and, and, and life uh, path. Yeah. I think that's, that's beautiful. Um, I, do, I do wanna leave some, some um, time for, for audience questions, but hopefully this is also something that will come out from audience questions too, like, and help us think about how does audience interaction change the dynamics of performance and move us to the futures that we wanna to move to. Uh, so first I wanna thank you all for, uh, uh, for, for answering my questions and uh, open the floor to Sonia to, to tell us what the audience is, is thinking. Oh, so we can move towards closing or I can leave it open to, to, to Ronnie or Kyoko if you wanna talk about audience and how the audience um, that relationship that you build as a performer with your audience, how that that works out. Um, if you have a, a few words you want to say about that. Yeah, I was wondering if you to go first. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, no, thanks for this question, um, Jessica. I was, um, uh, I, I was really riffing off of um, Hector, what you were saying about the, you know, we, we talk about these big ideas and how important it is, but yeah, it's, it can be, it's like the incredible work of the artist to distill that into an experience that you know is gonna have a transformative effect on the particular audience you have who may just be like, yeah, I'm really tired. I had a really tough day. This is my way of unwinding. And like, yes, there can be challenge. Yes, there could be questions. Yeah, it can be um, provocative, but you know, it's not. Um, it, there's going to be different approaches for for different folks needed, right? So um, there was a um, a piece I've, I felt really privileged to work on um, during my time at Octopus uh, at Octopus Theatricals. That was um, Phantom Limb Company's work, um, Falling Out. That um, was also about the um, the disaster that happened in. Um, Fukushima and the approach that they took um, to, um, I guess, both to unpacking what happened and to imagining hope was one that really took art forms you wouldn't think about. Um, so um, life-size, life-scale puppetry and Buteau and crump dance <laughs> and put it together with this gorgeous, um, projection and original music that you felt like you were watching a bit of a, a meditation on um, on what transpired. And then, um, you know, from that imagining something different. Um, but, uh, but I'll also say, you know, I think that there is um, some of my favorite 
work that's happening right now is work that is, um, you know, imagining something different. And, and I love that, like, the, that sci-fi is actually getting a, a kind of a fresh look for its ability to kind of imagine new futures. And, you know, um, indigenous artists and, you know, incredible black visionaries like, um, uh, um, oh gosh, of course, is it going to go out of my head? Um, uh, like Parable of the, the Sower and things like that, the kind of Afrofuturist. Octavia Butler. Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> it's like, it's right there. Um, you know, I think that work like that, that previously had not been given the attention it, it really deserved. And now that it's, it's really coming forward, um, I, I get really excited about that as a, um, as a different way in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So yeah, um, I think performing arts is such a um, rare and maybe cost ineffective in a way um, form, um, but that's just, if you just look at the, especially in nonprofit, but if you look at the depth of the impact, the lasting impact, the, the production can have. Um, definitely, you know, um, it's a very special. Um, and I, other word that I'm thinking about is, you know, there, there, there are two thoughts, opposite thoughts. So one is that, okay, arts or performing arts or something on stage uh, is something different from your ordinary life, lives. So that's special. So that's kind of evoke uh, interest, but, also, with um, how the world is going, um, with the uh, with the uh, you know availability of the of the Zoom technology and everything, uh, digitalization, you can you know our conversation can be shared with the whole world now. Right now, it, it is amazing. Um, what to say? Um, so you know, it's it's about integrating different what you thought was different people in different locations also people with different like uh, you know expertise or the or the or the knowledge um and uh yeah and then also like i, I think it was in 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 the questions that uh, uh, jessica sent us too that how do you engage people when you're addressing um the the, the global burning issues you know um you know, food, for example, that connects everyone, and every culture have different beauty in the in the in the uh, food way. You know, and then it connects with the health. Everybody cares for that. You know, um, and like you again, we have um, the 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 uh, part of the mission is to to appeal to five all five senses. You know, so to to feel to smell good, <laughs> to uh, you know feel good and. Um, you know, to 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 make that kind of like a welcoming and again engaging uh, uh, arrangement for the audience too is is good is a is an important thing. Um, but but you know, live performance. I mean, it's not just the performers who, who who's uh, on stage. It's the audience energy and and reaction that feedback and. That makes something special, and uh, um, I think I think it has uh, a powerful, very powerful uh, potential to to address uh, any um, pressing issues as well as um, stories. Yeah. Great. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you again uh, to to all the panelists. Um, and thank you, thank you for the Ling Ling. Thank you for Elizabeth uh, for getting us all together for this really important conversation. I've learned a lot, and I really enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoyed this, and I'll hand it over. I'll hand it back to Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Kyoko. Thank you, Hector. Um, I, if you know me, you know this is one of my favorite things to talk about, and. It has been such an honor to get to know you all more through this conversation. And I think that our audience is really going to um, benefit from having some of these really foundational concepts elaborated um, and such an important conversation for now. Um, I can't wait to see you all again here in Sarasota when that time comes. And thanks um, for all of our viewers today for coming on. <laughs>